Well, again, good morning to those of you here in the uh, assembly and then to you online. Good morning. We want to welcome you to our worship service this morning. We uh, have just a wonderful opportunity. Hopefully we're going to have some beautiful weather here today. Uh, looking forward to it. A little sunshine and a little, as uh, Miss Hilda and I were talking, a little bit of wind too would be, would be helpful in drying out some of the yards, wouldn't it? I know mine is, uh, is still kind of spongy as well. Um, it's just a, it's a great day that we can still be together and worship together and regardless of whatever the setting is. You know, we've, we've been in every, every conceivable situation. We've been in our houses and, and broadcast the service uh, via Facebook and YouTube. We've been in, uh, in, this, in the assembly and we've been in here for a long time. Uh, now for several weeks and we just pray that that continues that we can be together and worship together uh, in this corporate setting as well uh, this morning we want to talk about uh, or look at a, a passage of scripture from Lamentations and uh, particularly a, a situation that Jeremiah writes about if, if Jeremiah if, if Lamentations had been written today this would be like Jeremiah's blog because what he does is he writes about the exploits uh, of the situation with regard to, uh, to, Israel, to Judah and to Jerusalem, and particularly the siege and the fall of, of Jerusalem. And he's just heartbroken by, by how that things led up to this, how that the people uh, took no, they had no concern for their consequences of sin, and as a result, God allowed the Babylonians to come in and, and, and take over Jerusalem. And um, he allowed this to happen in, in such a way that it was, it was almost like that the, uh, the Israelites or the, were, or the people of Jerusalem just didn't even realize that it was taking place. It just, it just happened. And so God brought this punishment on them or allowed this punishment to come upon them. And in an effort to try to turn them, we know that as you follow the history, that there will be a, a return. Then they'll return the uh, they'll return back to uh, to the city. They'll rebuild the walls and stuff under Ezra and Nehemiah, and we see a, a, a change in the hearts and in the minds of the people. But it's it's there's a passage of scripture that's in this first chapter that's interesting as uh, as we read this morning, and as we. Uh, sort of prepare our hearts and our minds for, for the, the lesson here in a little bit. And as Jeremiah has watched all these things unfold, people just seem to be walking in the streets in, in this midst of chaos, in this midst of persecution, in, this fa in the face of suffering. And he says in verse 12, he says, Is this nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see. Is there any pain like mine which was dealt out to me, which the Lord made me suffer on the day of his burning anger? He's, he's saying basically, don't you care? Look what I've seen. And don't you care about this situation as well? Aren't you a caring people or shouldn't you be a caring people? Let's be standing, have a word of prayer, and this morning we'll look at being caring Christians. Father, we just rejoice in knowing you, our Lord and our Savior, and uh, the opportunity that we have to worship together in uh, spirit and in truth. What a, what a joy, what a privilege to come together in this fashion. What a privilege to be able to share the this, uh, this songs together uh, in, in both in this format, in this setting, and also online as well with those who are watching. We pray that... Uh, all will be uh, find a word of encouragement here this morning and that we'll find a measure of blessing and, and strength through the word and through the songs, through the prayers, through our time together in communion even. In everything, we just uh, seek your guidance and your direction through the presence of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>
As I mentioned a moment ago, we uh, are looking at this chapter in Lamentations, and uh, as we look at this idea of caring Christians, kind of goes along with what we talked about last week as well, and uh, with regard to God's grace, and then the week before, uh, with regard to our, our relationship and how that we should be reaching out, in, or the theme of how we should be reaching out into our communities. You know, when, and I'll probably say this again, but just bear with me right now. One of the things we need to understand is that we sort of have this tendency as individuals to adopt these various ideas about what God wants us to do. There is one straightforward command in Scripture, and that is that we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is a direct commission handed out by God. In the process of doing that, we are to do these things that would lend people to see that the Christian life, what we're promoting, what we've been, command, what we've been commissioned to carry out, that Christian life is worth the living. It's kind of like the, the song says. It's this, this idea that it's worth living this life. And to do that, it, it, we follow this instruction of Jesus with regard to, to reaching out to individuals and trying to care for those individuals. There is a point in time when you look at the book of Lamentations, when you, when you see that there had become, there had, it had come about that there was just a lack of care or concern for the situation at hand. And I don't know if we really understand just how horrendous this situation was but when Jeremiah is writing siege has been laid by the Babylonians and uh, by Nebuchadnezzar and the city was basically being starved out and it became so bad if you go back to 2 Kings and you begin to read there with regard to that I think it's around chapter 24 of 2 Kings what you see is that it became so bad and those situations are in, the, in that circumstance that actually people were, were so hungry that they were killing their young children and eating their children. That, that just seems horrendous to us. I, I mean, it's, it's almost, it, it, it turns your stomach to think that situation, had, that situation had arisen out of the circumstance. But that's how devastated, devastated the, the, the circumstances were. How, and and I, I think you have to understand, this is what Jeremiah is seeing. He's watching this unfold. And it seems like that people have just become insensitive to what's going on around them. I'm pretty sure that we're going to make some, uh, some correlation with our lives uh, today and the way that we look at the world in, in this day and time. But in Lamentations chapter 1, I'm going to pick out a few verses here that we want to read. Uh, we're going to look at verse 1, verse 8, and then verses 11 and 12. And so that's going to sort of be our springboard text this morning as we jump into this. And those that you are following online... Uh, we encourage you to get your Bibles and, and look at this passage together. I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Version. Uh, and so here is what he has to say in, in verse 1 of Lamentations as Jeremiah writes his, as I said earlier, his blog. He says, How she sits alone, the city once crowded with people. She who was great among the nations has become like a widow. Now, let me stop right there and inject something. You understand that in that day and time, culturally, a widow had no voice. A widow was one that had, uh, that basically was just overlooked. 
As a matter of fact, God had to hand out directives that, that, that they were to care for the widows. James talks about true and undefiled religion is to care for widows and orphans in their affliction, right? So this is the situation, is that Jerusalem has become like a widow. She has no voice anymore among the nations. The princess among the provinces has been put to forced labor. She's fallen now into, into uh, slavery. She weeps uh, bitterly. Uh, oops, let me, I didn't mean to read uh, verse 2. Let's skip on down to verse 8. Jerusalem has sinned grievously. Therefore, she has become an object of scorn. All who honor her now despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns away. Why has she become an object of scorn? Because what? She has, she has, she's no longer righteous in the eyes of God. She has deserted God. And we find that what happened is that uh, theologically she had taken up uh, the worship of other idols. Other things were more important. The material things of the world became more important. The, the, the things that the other nations had. Remember there was a time in, Isra in Israel's history when they wanted a king like all the other, other nations. And we realize how that worked out for them when, uh, when uh, Saul was uh, selected as king. Verse 11 and 12. All her people groan while they search for bread. They're starving. They have traded their precious belongings for food in order to stay alive. Lord, look and see how I have become despised. Jeremiah continues to promote that they need to turn to God, and they just, they say, you don't know what you're talking about. It's because of God we're in this situation. And then he says, is this nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see, is there any pain like mine, which was dealt, to me, dealt out to me, which the Lord made me suffer on this day of his burning anger? There's a hint of, of uh, a little hint of anger or, or frustration on Jeremiah's part even is that God's made me look at this and see this. You see, Jerusalem had once been a great and crowded city. She had been uh, a testimony to the world of the power and the glory of God. If people wanted to know, if people were, were to see God in that day and time, then they just had to look to Jerusalem. And in it stood the glorious temple that uh, Solomon had built. And inside its walls, families had lived, children played, love had been shared. It had been a city of peace and prosperity as God had showered his blessings upon them. Because they were God's people, they had chosen to serve and honor and glorify God. But in 586 B.C., Jerusalem was destroyed. And the scene in the, la in the first chapter of Lamentations is a scene of absolute destruction. Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, lay siege to Jerusalem. Jerusalem starved out. They clear, they clear it out. Take, off, take the people off into captivity. Then they come back and they lay Jerusalem to waste. They destroy the temple. They destroy all the idols. This was to say that they had defeated the God of the Israelites. The walls of the city and the homes in which families had lived and all had been reduced to rubble and mixed with the stones were the broken toys of children. Jeremiah watched. He saw pe people passing by the ruins. He was appalled. He was appalled at their reaction or rather their lack of reaction. They didn't seem to care at all. No one seemed to care in that situation. They didn't cry. They didn't laugh. They simply walked on by showing no emotion and no concern at all. And Jeremiah looks at them and he cries out, Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? They were absolutely, here's the word, they were absolutely insensitive to it all. So I wonder, just how insensitive are we? How insensitive are we this day? 
How do we react when we hear about thousands of men, women, and children being slaughtered in the Sudan? How do we react about the myriads of children that are sold into slavery? How do we react to the tens of thousands that, that died in Haiti during the earthquake? How does it, does it, does it bother us that nearly one-third of the world's population will go to bed hungry tonight and many of those will die of starvation? More importantly, and this is, this, let's bring it home to us as Christians today. Let's bring it home to us living in the 21st century. More importantly, does it bother you to hear that there are millions of people who are lost and dying without ever hearing the good news that Jesus came to save them from their sins. Just how sensitive are we today? I got a proposition for you this morning, an important point that I want to make in this message, and that is that I, I hope you'll listen carefully and remember. It is this. If we are... The children of God, if we claim to follow Jesus, then we must be loving, caring Christians. Now think about what I just said, and let's draw some conclusions from it. And the first conclusion is this. Our world is filled with many people who are uncaring. We live in a state, in a society, in a global society, whereby that people are literally uncaring. Several years ago, I read a, a story, an illustration about a lady who drowned in Lake Michigan. And as she was drowning, she cried out for help. Three able-bodied men were standing on the shore and heard her cries, but they made no effort to help her. They just stood there. Someone called the rescue squad, and when they drug her lifeless body out of Lake Michigan, they asked these three men, why did you not help this lady? Why didn't you make an effort to save her from drowning. And the response was revealing to the situation that exists in our society, our global society today. I don't want to, I don't want to say just us. This is a global problem. But our society today, and that is these men said the water was too cold. All of us have heard stories about women being attacked in parking lots. Just saw the other day some cameras, uh, some uh, video camera in a parking lot or something caught some lady where someone had snatched her purse and she's hanging onto her purse and being drugged down the road by the car. People crying out for help and other individuals standing by closing or closing their doors and closing their windows and ignoring the cries for help. And the question is, is they are the statement is they don't want to get involved so the question isn't for us today how sensitive are we to the needs of others the real question is why are why are we so insensitive why are there so many people who really don't seem to care anything at all about what happens to others there are two possible answers to this and they come out of a out of a work by Viktor Frankl, who was a prisoner during, of the Nazis during World War II. And he wrote about his experience in his book, and he talks about the emotional stages that a prisoner of war goes through during captivity. And he wrote that the final and most awful stage is one where the prisoner actually ends up murdering his own emotions. Why? Frankel says, you can only view human suffering so long. 
What he's saying is you can only view human suffering so long and not do anything about it. And in a, in a, ca a situation of captivity, your, your hands are tied. You basically can't, not literally, but your hands are tied to the point where you can't do anything about it. You, if you are sensitive, if you're compassionate, it hurts. When you have seen so much suffering, you kill your own emotions. And the result is that you can watch your you can watch your friend being knocked down and picked up and knocked down again and never, never look the other way and never feel anything. <clears throat> it becomes a defense mechanism. And we use it to shield ourselves. Because we don't want to hurt anymore. I've got some theories as to how that happens in our culture today. I think maybe our all-pervading coverage of situation within the world through media, uh, mass media, through social media, has done that to us. Every time we pick up a newspaper or turn on the news, uh, we hear of more human suffering. Maybe we've heard too much. Maybe we've cried all the tears that we can cry. Maybe we felt all the sympathy that we can feel until finally we've, we've murdered our emotions. We become insensitive. You know, we just kind of look at the situation and say, wow, isn't that awful? And then we flip the channel to something else or we turn the page in the newspaper to something else or we scroll down the screen of the social media uh, page to something else. And now all of a sudden we can, uh, we can sit there looking at it all and we never shed a tear we just hmm, wow isn't that awful we show no emotion we are indifferent to the situation that because what happens is within us that becomes the safe place to be a place where we can't hurt any more we don't want to hurt emotionally we talk about individuals on our prayer list some that physically they're doing fine but yet emotionally and spiritually, they're struggling. Insensitive to the situation. Now, many people are insensitive because it costs something. You have to put, you have to pay out to be sensitive. You have to pay out to care. And a prime example of this, and we looked at this last week, we were talking about this, and that is the Good Samaritan. You see, the two men who passed by, the Samaritan, who passed by on the other side, the priest and the Levite, met their appointments on time. They weren't late. They had just as much money in their pocket after they encountered the Samaritan as they did when they got to their destination. They went on their way and it didn't cost them anything. But the Samaritan, on the other hand, the Samaritan dared to stop and he found that it cost him a great deal. It cost him time, possessions, money. He was late for his next appointment. You see, he is the only one in the whole story that we call good to. It always costs something. Listening here this morning, listening online, folks, pay attention to what we're saying here, what Scripture is teaching us. It always costs something when you dare to care. It will cost you something. The founder of the Nav of Navigator Press was a man by the name of Dawson Trotman. Uh, Trotman was convinced that the hope of the church was for Christians, older, particularly older Christians, to take younger Christians under their wings and teach them in much the same way that Jesus taught his disciples. Teaching them how to care, teaching them how to be compassionate, teaching them about having concern for others and the plight of others. Trotman died tragically. He died from drowning. And, and the interesting thing about it is that Trotman was an expert swimmer. 
And you see, he encountered one day, he encountered two young girls who were drowning in a lake, and he dove in to help the two girls. He was able to rescue one. He brought her safely out of the water, and then he went back into the lake, into the murky water, searching for the other girl, the second girl. And the story said that Trotman never surfaced. Finally, they drugged the lake, and they found both bodies. And Time Magazine did a story on this with, with Trotman, about Dawson Trotman, and they had a write-up about his death, and in it they said Trotman was always lifting somebody else up. But it costs something to do that. It's easier to be critical. It's easier to put people down. It's easier to be condescending towards individuals. It is difficult. It costs me something to lift people up. But that's exactly what Jesus did. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever, wants, whoever loses his life for me will find it. I have to be less like me, less like human nature, less of an individual who is always condescending, always critical, always putting people down, always trying to win an argument, and more like Jesus. Dawson Trotman cared. But the sad conclusion in all of this is that there are many people in the world who really don't care anything at all about what happens to others. They don't care what happens to others. And, and the point of that is, is that by, by not caring, we play into the hands of evil. We play into the hands of, of Satan by not caring. I think it was probably two or three weeks ago I used a, a, a story from C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, and I, I want to share you another one because I, I, that book is so insightful. What Lewis does with that is extremely insightful as to how that potentially that Satan works in our world. If you'll recall, it's a conversation, the book is a conversation between Screwtape and his nephew. His nephew's name is Wormwood. And Wormwood is an, uh, an apprentice devil. He's learning the ropes. And in this conversation, in this particular chapter, it goes something like this as Screwtape tells Wormwood. He says, now your task, your assignment is, to not, is not to go out and make bad people. I'll take care of that. He's the, ma he's the master in all of this. He's the teacher. Your job as an apprentice devil is to go out and, and you, is not to go out and make uh, not to go out and make bad people. I'll supply the world with an abundant number of evil people to do evil things. What I want you to do is to cause good people to do here it is nothing. That's all you have to do. Just make all of your people comfortable. Cause them to be content with the way things are. We found ourselves in the midst of, uh, of uh, a pandemic and we've become comfortable with the way things are. We find churches Everywhere, and, and the estimations are that churches are going to are going to come back. That when this is all over, we're back in the sanctuaries and and we're worshiping together. Those some are still not worshiping together in certain areas, but we're back worshiping together. You're going to find this is that you're going to have about twenty percent of your attendance because we become comfortable in doing it a different way. God does not want us to be comfortable. And if you elect to be, if you elect to choose that, to be, to be comfortable, you are going against his instruction. Let me go on with, the, with this. I kind of got, kind of digressed there. But let me, let me just jump into this again. Screwtape says, if they ever begin to think seriously about anything of great importance, then get them to think instead about what they are going to eat at their next meal. 
cause them to worry about their digestive system. Get their attention off of whatever is important and keep them comfortable. You just keep good men doing nothing. I'll supply evil people. I'll supply all the evil men the world needs. You know, when I read that, Wormwood has done a good job, hasn't he, of keeping us comfortable. Many of you have heard the story. If you ever have an opportunity to, to, to read about it, read about William Wilberforce or even the movie uh, with, uh, surrounding his life. William Wilberforce was a member of the English Parliament. He vigorously crusaded against slavery in the 1700s. In fact, in 1789, he authored and presented a bill before Parliament in England that would have made it unlawful for Englishmen to sell slaves to the brand new colonies of the United States, or the brand new United States of America by then. Wilberforce presented his bill twice in Parliament, and it was tabled both times. It means a vote was never taken on it. But on the third occasion, he had worked so hard that he was convinced he finally had enough votes for his bill to pass. On the night it came up for a vote for the third time, a comic opera premiered in London. Twelve members of Parliament who supported Wilberforce's bill went to the opera instead of Parliament. And at the very time they were applauding this new opera, the vote was taken and the bill was defeated, 74-70, and the slave trade continued. I wonder how much the history of our nation was affected, how much misery occurred, how many suffered, because 12 men went to the opera instead of taking care of their responsibilities. And today, as terrible as it is, our greatest threat is not radical Islam. I'm convinced our greatest threat arises from good men and women who are children of God, who are insensitive to the needs of others, and who do nothing because we're comfortable. For us to be uncaring is to play into the hands of the evil. But I want you to know this. There are good and caring people in this world. And I stand here this morning and look out and see good and caring people. Individuals who are willing to do something for a neighbor, willing to step up and help out in the situation. Individuals who care about the suffering and the needs of others. It's like the Paul Harvey story about Henry Durant, Dunant. Henry Dunant was born in 1828 in Switzerland. Henry Dunant was an individual who was born to a very wealthy family. He was uh, born with a silver spoon in his mouth, we would say. He could have lived his whole life in absolute luxury, lazy luxury. And yet, Dunant was a kind and caring young man who visited the sick. He helped out the poor. And as a young man, he established an organization in Switzerland called the Young, the young Men's Christian Union, which was designed to help teenage boys. And when he became an adult, he went into business on his own and did very well. And one day, he had an appointment with Napoleon III, whose armies were at war in Italy. Now, do not travel to Italy to meet with Napoleon III. And on the way, he passed, the latest, he passed the, the latest battlefield, and he saw the atrocities of war. He looked at bayonets and guns rusting in the mud, and nearly 40,000 bodies crying out in agony, pain, or dead. Some were even cursing as they breathed their last breath. And Dunant couldn't turn away from that. He went to the nearest town and he persuaded the townspeople to turn the church into a first aid station. He persuaded citizens in that town to help him and they took stretchers and they went out into the battlefield and they brought the wounded back to this church, this first aid station. He worked side by side with the doctors for three weeks Three weeks with almost no sleep, ministering 
to wounded and to their needs. Dinant finally went home, but he couldn't forget what he had experienced. So he started writing to this nation and to that nation, to all the influential people that he knew. And finally, one day in Geneva, Switzerland, to an international gathering, he presented a resolution. Quick point of reference, or quick, quick note here at this point, is that we, so many times we see a problem and we're quick to point out the problem, but we need to come up with a resolution. He presented a resolution that we know today as the Geneva Convention, signed by 22 nations, granting immunity to doctors and nurses and ambulances so that they could go out into the battlefields and bring back the wounded and the dying without fear of being shot themselves. And they adopted as their symbol, you know it, see it all the time, the Red Cross on a white background. Today, wherever there are floods, wherever there are tornadoes or hurricanes, where there is war, there is, you will find, the Red Cross. You knew about the Red Cross, but did you know that it all started because Henry Dinant could not turn his back on the misery that he saw? He couldn't pass by without trying to do something about it. Okay. My point in all of this, as we bring this to a close, wrap this up really quickly, is this, is that as I sit here and address both you and those online, I propose if we are children of God, if we claim to follow Jesus, then when we see a need, we need, we must do something. We must be loving and caring Christians. Never let it be said of Rosemary or of any of us as individuals. Never, ever let it be said. Is, is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? We as Christians will respond, it is something to me. I care because he cares for me. I care because he loves me. I love because he first loved me. We have to care, folks. Not because I stand up here and say that we have to care. Not that. that doesn't mean anything. It's just words. It's words. It's just words until you, until you connect it to Jesus. And then it's a lifestyle. And that's what this is all about. It's, it's about being like Jesus. It's about demonstrating his grace, demonstrating concern, being compassionate to people. It's about caring. It's about changing lives. We have to care. There are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that die every day and never have heard the message of Jesus that there is a Savior that God sent his only son only begotten that salvation might come to this world You're outside of Christ this morning. If you're not a Christian, then I want you to know I care about you. 
whether you're here or you're watching online, I care. And there's nothing more that I want than to see you come to a saving relationship with Jesus, surrendering your life to his lordship, turning from a life of sin, finding forgiveness as you participate in a burial with him in baptism. There is, there is nothing, nothing I could want more than that for anyone. I love you. Online, same thing. You need to make that decision, whether here in person or online, then we encourage you to do that. And if you're not sure what all you need to do, if you're watching online this morning, then we encourage you to contact us. I say this every Sunday. Not because, not because we're looking for contacts or numbers or anything like that. We're looking to change lives and save souls. Because we care. We don't ever want it to, we don't ever want it to be said that we just watch. As people pass by, not care. Let's stand as we sing our invitation. table as it is this morning is a figurative one, but we do come to share a meal, to commune with Jesus. We need to remember that the shepherd prepared the table. Not only that, as it says here in this short passage that I'm going to read from this book, he dealt with snakes. You remember that only one of the disciples didn't complete the meal that night. The devil had already persuaded Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to turn against Jesus, John 13, 2 tells us. Judas started to eat, but Jesus didn't let him finish. On the command of Jesus, Judas left the room. The thing that you will do, do it quickly. Judas took the bread Jesus gave him and immediately went out. It was night, John 13, verses 27 and 30 tells us. There is something dynamic in this dismissal. Jesus prepared a table in the presence of the enemy. Judas was allowed to see the supper. 
but he wasn't allowed to stay there. In essence, Jesus was saying, you are not welcome here. This table is for my children. You may tempt them, you may trip them, but you will never sit with them. This is how much he loves them. And if any doubt remains, lest there be any Peters who wonder if there is a place at the table for them, Jesus issues a tender reminder as he passes the cup. Every one of you drink this. This is my blood, which is the new agreement that God makes with his people. This blood is poured out for many to forgive their sins. Remember what was said there. Every one of you drank this. Those who feel unworthy drank this. Those who feel ashamed drank this. Those who feel embarrassed drank this. He goes on to tell about a time in his life when he did something that really hurt him. It embarrassed him. But yes, you know, we all have a sin problem. We all struggle with something. My problem is not your problem. But we know that we all fall short. He wanted to share this with us, but folks, we need to remember that regardless of our problem, and I want you to help me finish this sentence, and I want you to speak out loud, confession is good for the soul. Yes. He said, a few days later, I shared my struggle with the elders and some members of the con congregation and was happy to chalk up the matter to experience and move on. He writes, but I couldn't. The shame plagued me of all the people to do such a thing. So many could be hurt by my stupidity. All the times to do such a thing en route to minister at a retreat. He says, what hypocrisy. I felt like a boom. Forgiveness found its way into my head, but the elevator designed to lower it 18 inches to my heart was out of order. And to make matters worse, Sunday rolled around. I found myself on the front row of the church awaiting my turn to speak. Again, I had been honest with God, honest with the elders, honest with myself, but still I struggle. Would God want a guy like me to preach? He says the answer came in the supper. The Lord's Supper. The same Jesus who prepared a meal for Peter had prepared one for me. The same shepherd who had trumped the devil trumped him again. The same Savior who built a fire on the shore stirred a few embers in my heart. Every one of you drank this. And so I did. It felt good to be back at the table. Let's pray. Father, you just love us so much. You have done so much for us. We've been reminded, Father, this morning that we have to act. We have to be engaged. It's going to cost us. We have to be giving of ourselves. We have to follow your example because you showed you were willing to sacrifice your son. Your son who gave his very life, he gave everything. Father, help us to understand this, to grasp it, to apply it to ourselves, to realize, Father, that we must do more. That it's not just a simple few acts of being obedient. It's a lifetime, Father, of worship. It's a lifetime of service. And we need to realize, Father, that we need to give you more of ourselves. Father, help us to realize that we must give you the top place. The tip top. Not among them, not among our top priorities, the top priority. Father, we ask you to be with us in this new week of life. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. Help us, Father. Help us to seek you, to look to you, 
to get that guidance. We can't beat it, Paul, but you can. With your help, we can conquer those things that are unconquerable to us. Father, we ask for your guidance in this new week of life. We ask you to be with us just now as we partake of these emblems. Help us to realize, Father, how blessed we are to have you as our Heavenly Father and to have your Son as our Savior. Father, be with us, watch over and guide us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Stand with us as we close out this morning. day for the privilege to come together and just to honor and glorify you through your son Jesus. Thank you that you lead us in worship through your presence and the power of your spirit and that we can worship you in the spirit and the truth. In Jesus name. Amen. Have a great week. God bless.